Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. We are here at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival introducing an extremely beautiful film we're going to get into called A Place in the Field. And we're sitting down with, we have a party crew here today. We have our director, Nicole Mejia. We have our co-writer slash star, Don DePetta. Our producer, Halia Alam, and our cinematographer, Kadri Koop. Welcome to Bitch Talk, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to kick this off with our director here, Nicole. Can you introduce our audience to A Place in the Field? Yeah, um, A Place in the Field is, a, is about a veteran named Joe Scuderi, whose best friend has just recently committed suicide and sent him his ashes and a letter asking him to go out on a road trip that they were supposed to take together. So he goes out on this road trip across the American Southwest and finds a little bit of healing along the way. The film is beautiful and and we'll get into, I want to talk about New Mexico. I want to talk about cinematography, but I want to talk to Don because he's a stand-up comedian, IRL. And I want to know if your stand-up led itself, lent itself to your character at all. Are there moments, because there are moments in the film where it is comedic and I love some of the lines that made me laugh out loud. And did that help with this film? Yeah, I think I think we're tackling such a serious subject matter about uh, veterans and, and veteran suicide that, uh, you know, it, it, there were pitfalls. Like if this was just a story strictly about that and, and what they were going through the entire time, we would have it would have felt very one note. And I think people would have checked out along the way. They would have been like, oh, yeah, we get it. Here it is. But I think uh, what I love and some of the most serious parts of the film had the most levity in them. Um, and I think. Yeah, I think writing and, and doing stand up in real life lent itself to that. It was always we were always searching for those moments that we could find. Yeah. And, and we'll we'll chime in, have our producer and, and cinematographer chime in on, as Aaron said, the locations and just the the beauty of this film. Um, we go to so many different places. So uh, scouting wise, how was that and how did you decide where you were going to go? And also, can you talk about how the, the beauty and the peacefulness of the cinematography was paralleling just this inner turmoil that Gio is, is dealing with. Basically, as you see, you know, this probably would have been like, you know, two months of shooting if we we needed to, you know, do it properly and scout. And um, as this is an indie film, it was very beautiful because it kind of turned into a road trip of its own. Um, after the screening, uh, one of our producers was like, we needed to make a movie behind the, uh, of the behind the scenes of the movie. And, you know, I think Nikki, Nicole and Kadri and the team would just kind of drive around and for hours to find the, the right location. And Kadri can speak more to that. I would say a lot of these locations sort of found us perhaps more than we found them. Um, it's almost like blind faith that we were able to capture so many beautiful locations as we were because a lot of it wasn't pre-scouted. Our pre-scout basically meant we would go out 4 a.m. <laughs> and we would shoot there maybe 6 a.m. And so... <laughs> wow. So it was that was the extent of a lot of these pre scouts because we were on a tight schedule and the heat and travel and everything was pretty exhausting. So it was mostly Nikki and I, we would go together in the morning really, really early to make sure that there is a place that has like the, the most important essence that we're looking for, for for that scene, whether it's like emotional or like, whether it's like a tonal thing or maybe like there is a some kind of a um, story prop or vista that's already there that kind of speaks to us. Um, and I think you said it so well, these landscapes are um, sort of perhaps like balancing this inner turmoil that our character is going through. And I think that's a really great way of, of thinking about all the natural beauty and uh 
and our character in this film. Speaking of natural beauty, I wanted to bring up the sequence of the horse therapy. Um, and I don't know if Dawn can talk about that as one of the co-writers. Where was where did the idea come from? How did it come up? And also my take on that while I was watching it was, and maybe Kadri can talk about this or Nicole, I felt like there was inspiration from Chloe Zhao's The Writer a little bit and wanted to know if that played any part in the film. Yeah, so we're studying at AFI and Chloe actually came to speak to us and I was I just really admired how she um, went out and just made a movie, you know, and it was like six, her crew was like six people. Um, and one of them actually studied uh, cinematography right above Kadri, Kadri's class. So we reached out to him and we asked how they did it. Um, he gave us a lot of advice and then we're like, all right, we're going to go do the same thing, you know, uh, and we went to New Mexico and my friend um, Sochi, who's in the movie and wrote the poem, um, she lives right next door to a horse ranch. And I said, can you ask them if we can shoot there, you know? And she was like, sure, let's, let's ask. And they said, yes. And so <laughs> they are a real horse therapy. So what I really loved about this place is that the horses are all rescues. So the therapy is actually more for the horses than for the humans, but because of that, um, the human gets so much therapy as well. And so we went, like Kadri said, we would either scout early morning or very late night, but this one, we happened to go the day before the shoot so we could understand what it was like. And they were like, do you, we actually, they told me, they're like, we picked out a horse for you because we want you to have therapy. Um, I've been through a lot of sexual abuse in my life, which is what how I related to the PTSD in the film. And so they gave me a horse that had been um, used for breeding and they would um, take her babies right after, right after she had them. So she would just be like going through this over and over and they rescued her. And so we had that session and it was just Kadri and I, and I think one of the, or Kato. Sochi, Kato. Kato, yeah, our production designer. And they watched me struggle with this horse who didn't want to interact with me. And um, it took about an hour. And then finally it was what, what broke inside of me that got the horse to then, um, follow me and then we connected but it took a really long time and after that we all started crying Kadri is a hard ass and even Kadri was crying and I was like oh my god we made her cry <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think like broke I think, the DP. <laughs> yeah I think I think what people resonate with about that scene is and and a lot of people have said that is that there's there's no acting there in that scene. Like uh, we showed up that day and, you know, Nicole had done it the day before and, and Yost, the trainer was like, you know, are, are you going to act? Are you really going to do this? And I was like, well, I, I guess we're, I guess we're doing therapy. And so that, that's a real therapy session. Um, uh, and, and what, to what Nikki's point is, is like, you can't have any walls up or you can't, you can't pretend to be anything. You can't try and connect with this. You legitimately have to just shed self and ego and all of everything else and just allow yourself to just be here and, and vulnerable with another being. And that's, and I think that's kind of what's felt in that scene. Ooh, wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's so beautiful that you were living what you were filming, essentially. Um, it, they, they were yeah. parallel. That's, that's so crazy. Um, Nicole, I read your um, director's statement and you talk about how 40% of veterans are Latino, which clearly we don't see on the big screen or, or talk about at that. You know, Aaron and I, both of our fathers were vets, you know, uncles, grandparents, you know, that's what they did. They, they came here as immigrants and they were so proud that they joined the military. Um, so I love that you talk about that and you're sharing that in this film. So can you talk about incorporating culture into the story of this vet? Yeah, I unfortunately didn't find out about that until um, our at the like the last day of our pickup shoot, and so then I said, "How can I honor the Latino culture?" Because in with veterans in in the post production process, you know. So I hired a a Latin composer, Alana Mill. He's Puerto Rican, and we set out to just 
like find the sounds of Spanish culture um, and use it in like a meditative kind of way throughout the film. And then obviously the Cielito Lindo, that came out the last day of shooting when they were all, we were shooting the military stuff. And I said, I said to um, our actor, Kelvin, I was like, sing a Latin song. I don't know anyone. And he was like, uh, I guess Cielito Lindo is like the only one I know. And then we're like, of course we're in Indies. So we're like, oh, can we get the rights for that song? And yes, it's over hundred years old. So it was kind of just natural how that came about. And if honestly, if I had known, I would have done a lot more work, I think to integrate but also just having like all the women in our film are Latinas um, and as well as the culture of New Mexico had that kind of flair. And so I think there is a little bit of things here and there, but for me, it was really important. And from now on, I will know that and I will, I will take more care to just in the future, be more prepared, I think. Um, but that was what we could do. And, and yeah, thank you for your parents' service. And you know, what's interesting, I was speaking today to we made another short about a street flower vendor here in LA and um, her son is in the Navy and she's Latin and she doesn't have her papers. And she was like, I just got a job. Um, Cause I, I put her in my film as her first acting opportunity. And then she was like, I got a commercial and they want to put me in the commercial, but they can't hire me cause I don't have my social. And I was like, oh man, um, why don't you use like your son is serving our country you know like is there a way that we can help you get your papers through him um so that's just something that stood out to me today uh, I want to talk to our producer um what drew you to this film especially with a first time feature film director yeah um for me when uh it was actually like mid to COVID and I had COVID and I was stuck in a hotel room. Uh, when Nikki and I uh, got connected um, through this uh, women in media group that we were a part of, and um, I was actually picking her brain about AFI and her, how her journey was. Um, then when she found out I've been producing for a couple of years, um, she sent me the script and they had already shot half of the film. Uh, I want to say like six months to seven months before we, we met. And she was like, hey, um, I need a producer because Don and I were producing on set while directing, acting, doing everything. And um, what do you think? And I watched some of her work. Um, like you said, I think... From a producer perspective, when we look at a project, it's very much what is what is the package package giving us? Um, is it a good script? What's the you know the director's background, their work, um, who's attached? All that you know business stuff. And I've always been a fan of like you know just finding talented people to work with, um, almost like breaking that rule. And when I saw Nikki's work, um, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And I read the script. It was beautiful. Um, we connected when we met and I loved that there was a female DP on board and she was female and just a bunch of badass people. Um, and yeah, and then I got on board and we may as I was, I was thankful to be able to be a part of you know, bringing it to life. I was going to bring up uh, that it's so refreshing to see this story of a vet being told, uh, directed by a woman. Um, so, so Don, I wanted to ask you, is that your intention? Were you searching for, when you were searching for a director for your project? And um, also for you, Nicole, you know, what, what kind of truths did you want to bring to this film that we've never seen before? Yeah, I think, I, let me just first say this, this film wouldn't have been possible without women. Um, the, the other women that are on the screen right now, they're, they're, they're what made this happen, uh, hands down and, and Cato as well, our production designer without them, none of the, and Naya Edwards, which, uh, another UPM on the project, none of this would have been possible. Um, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, because I tried to get this off the ground for a year and nothing happened. Um, and, and then with, with Nicole, I think, I think we've seen the Hollywood We've heard we've seen the Hollywood tropes of this story done over and over and over and over and over again. And it's incredibly heavy handed a lot of times. And I don't think it's an accurate representation with all the research that I did with all the people that I talked to. It's just not the day to day life. I grew up in Georgia. Like I have a handful of friends who are still serving currently. You know, my best friend's a Marine right now. The other one's in the Navy. Um, and that's and this isn't the daily 
you know, a gun to your head and screaming and pills isn't the day to day. Yes, it happens. And yes, it is part of it. But, uh, you know, but it's a small fraction of it. And I wanted to show like the day to day and the choice that these people have every single day. And, and so, uh, you know, I had a relationship with Nicole previously and basically I had to beg her to do this. It wasn't it wasn't that I showed her the original script and she was like, this is shit rewrite it, rewrite the whole thing. Um, and then she was like, and you need to put women in it and you need to do something else. And I don't know what you need to do, but you need to figure it out. And then I was like, okay, cool. Uh, let me figure out how to do that. And then I would send her scenes and she would be like, be it close, but no. And then I would send her another scene and she'd be like closer, but no. And then I would, you know, I sent some scenes 14 times before she was like, all right, cool. I'll shoot this. Um, and, 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 but I knew that I knew the way she sees the world and I knew the lens or, and how she wants to tell stories. And, and uh, I was so excited at the opportunity to have a male dominated story told by women. And I think like, that's the thing with this film that makes it really stand out is it because it's told by women. And I think for me, like, I actually really love all the films that I love are, I like the Sopranos and pretty much everything Scorsese. And I was like, what would happen if these gangster films were told by women? Like, I wonder how, different they would have been and I really am excited to do that with my life um and just like tell these stories but um I, we have a, a classmate uh Daniel Egbert who is our military consultant and he had done three tours in Iraq and he told me he hates watching veteran films or military films because he was like 95 percent of the time we're walking and making fun of each other and doing drugs or something stupid and then five percent is the bombing and deaths and obviously we didn't have the budget to do the bombings and to do all those things. So, yeah, no kidding. So it was like, how do we figure <laughs> out how to tell this story? And I think it's about people suffering in silence, you know? And it, and so I'm, I, like I said, about the sexual abuse history, like I think a lot of women who have been assaulted suffer in silence. A lot of veterans suffer in silence and they just pretend like they're okay and they numb out and they keep going through life. And, you know, they either commit suicide or they're just empty and, and don't allow themselves the opportunity to open up and live, like really live, you know? And so that's something that I had to choose to do for my life. And it's been so difficult and it's a decision every day. And so that's where this story sort of like lended itself towards my experience. And I was like, okay, I can tell that story. Cause I, I was also afraid of telling a better story. But because I connected with that element, then I was like, okay, I can do that. I love it. Thank you. And for all of the viewers, it's going to give them a connection to the story too, because it is universal, that pain. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today. Again, we've been talking to director Nicole Mejia, the co-writer and star Don DePetta, our producer Halia Alam, and our cinematographer Kadri Koop of the film A Place in the Field. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Welcome to the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. We are excited to bring you this documentary short called Fresh to Frightening, the Sharon Green Story. And we have with us our director, Gareth Kelly, and the subject of the film, Sharon Green. Welcome to Bitch Talk. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, we'll go ahead and get started with our director here. Can you introduce Fresh to Frightening to our audience? Yeah, uh, Fresh to Frightening, the Sharon Green Story is my first film. And it is a 20-minute short documentary about one of the most incredible and one of the most legendary yacht racing photographers in the world, and that is Sharon Green. And uh, yeah, that's the film. It's a day in the life of her with a little bit of origin story thrown in, and uh, we get to see her doing this incredible job. How did you two meet? We need to know the origin story. How did this happen? Uh, Gareth uh, interviewed me for a local uh, newspaper article a number of years ago, and um, um, you know, we kind of hit it off because we're both sailors and we actually talked about, you know, he, he asked me about this a long time ago and doing a documentary. And, you know, I guess, you know, back then I was just kind of like, you know, well, that would be really exciting, but you know, I, that's great because I mean, I would never do something like that about myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank God he did. Yeah, this was really fun to watch. And normally when you're watching a film, sometimes you have to wait all the way to the end to figure out what the title means. But Gareth, you hit us right in the open. And immediately I was like, I love her. I already was just, <laughs> I was all in with the open. So can you talk about your decision, Gareth, to just like 
throw it out there right in the beginning. And Sharon, I would love to hear when you, do you remember when you came up with this phrase for the perfect, uh, the perfect weather for photography, sailing photography? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've got to know Sharon in the last few years and uh, I was really excited about the helicopter stuff. I was like, helicopters are cool, right? Helicopters are so cool in general. And I was like, Sharon, you can't quite tell from the thing that you see in the film. She's pretty, she's pretty small and she's got all this giant equipment. And I was like, she's flying around in these helicopters. And I, I had this vision of Apocalypse Now <laughs> when, I, when I first started thinking about it. And I'm like, I just want to hit people out the gate that, this helicopter is dramatic. And, you know, as Sharon mentioned, I'm a sailor myself. And I've been seeing Sharon's images for years before I even knew her in sailing magazines and stuff. And so some of her images are incredible, as you've seen in the film. And so I was like, let's just give people a tease of the helicopter. And then we'll learn a bit more Sharon and then we'll throw some more helicopter in there. So that was kind of the thought process behind it. The, the term fresh to frightening came when I was working on America's Cup campaign in New Zealand. And this is, you know, a hundred plus person campaign uh, challenging for the America's Cup. And the weather team, I used to hang out with the weather team in the morning um, mm -hmm. when they would do the weather for the day, because we had a certain wind limitations, what we were allowed to sail in or permitted to sail in. And um, so this one day I came in and I was so excited, you know, because that's when my adrenaline gets going, you know, the windier and wetter and more miserable I am, the better are the photos. And... Um, <laughs> And so, uh, of course, if I'm in a helicopter, I'm high and dry, <laughs> but, um, and, and they're wet. Uh, so one morning I came in and the weather team who was, who was headed by an English chap said, oh, Sharon's going to love the forecast today. It is fresh to frightening. And so ever since then, I have said fresh to frightening. And those are the conditions and the days that I live for. Every day <laughs> should be like that. <laughs> Yeah, the helicopter footage was my favorite, but also frightening as well. The no doors on the helicopter, Sharon. Can yep. you share any scary moments or any kind of like, well, I'm going to die today kind of moments in your <laughs> photography? Because there has to be at least one. Oh, yes, there's definitely a few of those. <laughs> when um, I saw the no doors, I was like, well, she has to have you just look at that. You're like, yeah, you're, you're, I'm going to die. I'm going to gonna be like a day. I mean, we've all been through and every time you, you fly, but we've all been through the, you know, if you do go in the drink, you know, what, what's going to happen. And, um, and there's actually, you can actually take classes in this where they actually dunk you in a pool and they turn you upside down. Cause what happens is the helicopter will go straight upside down and then you have to figure out how to get out. And, um, and they do it in, in when it's dark because you're going to hit the water and it's going to be pretty dark. And um, anyhow, um, I've never done the training, but I have, um, you know, at least some knowledge of what would happen if we, we do, do go in. And, um, um, you know, the only time, you know, I've, I've never really been afraid at all. Like I'll be sitting, you know, we be taking off from the airport and I'll be like in my flip flops and, you know, barely even buckled in if I'm <laughs> buckled in. And, um, you know, I'm texting and doing stuff in the helicopters. We're, you know, on our way out. And, uh, but there was one particular time I've had many, many precautionary landings where, you know, the pilot heard something and we had to fly in. And one time it was in San Diego during an America's Cup in San Diego. And we stopped all air traffic at San Diego airport so we could land, you know, where the helicopter came in. And, um, and all it was, was some piece of tape or something that came loose and was making this noise that <laughs> bugged him. <laughs> so, but there was one, I was photographing one of my favorite clients and um, we were doing a reshoot. It wasn't actually during a race. We were doing a reshoot and my normal pilot or helicopter, he wasn't available that day. And so he said, oh, you know, go use this other company and this guy, he's great, blah, blah, blah. And so off we go. And this was a huge deal to get this team to go out into the ocean. This was in Hawaii and restage a finish that they had finished in the night during a long distance race. And so, and it was a double handed meaning there's only two people on board. And so anyhow, they, um, uh, they get the crew, they stuff the crew down below so we could do it quickly. And we go way offshore and they're coming down. And it was really, really windy. And this pilot obviously didn't know anything about sailing. And, um, and he started doing this dive. And in order to get altitude, you have to drop. 
and he got the tail rotor caught in the wind and we were going straight into the drink and somehow miraculously so my clients watching all this while they're sailing and you know getting ready for this photo shoot and they're all like trimmed up and and so we almost hit the drink once and then he almost did it again to the point the boat is texting me saying abort 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 you know this is obviously not going very well and i just remember getting back to the airport landing in honolulu and you know just kissing the ground going on so <laughs> oh my god on, on that note get <laughs> yeah, Gareth, were, were you scared in the helicopter? Is anybody scared in this helicopter? <laughs> and, but but also so, another question for you on top of yeah. that, um, was there anything that you were surprised to learn about Sharon throughout the, the filming of this? Um, I think not so much surprise I've got to know her now, but she really is fearless. You know, like she's jumping around in this helicopter and she's, you know, we kept trying to say when we were filming and even in the editing process, when we were having her do some voiceover, I'm like, you know, you gotta make it more scary. You gotta like, you know, you gotta like sound like you're worried, you know, cause she just takes it in her stride. You know, she's just like, oh, she's probably got been in God knows how many helicopters, right? But mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing about me in the helicopter, and this is somewhat embarrassing to say, I have been in a helicopter before and it's not the most comfortable experiences. However, in this particular instance, I didn't go in the helicopter. And the reason is I'm a biggish dude and my cinematographer is probably half my size. And that if I'd have gone in the helicopter, it would have, you know, it would have cost like 20 minutes of flight time, you know, because these small helicopters that Sharon flies in, uh, they're all about weight. And so my cinematographer, he had to take literally his camera and a spare battery and that was it. Had I gone in my beer belly, you know, they would have had 20, 20, 20 less minutes to fly. So unfortunately, I didn't get to go in the helicopter in that instance. But um, yeah, helicopters are pretty, if you've never been one and you go, they're cool, but it's a little, it's a little weird. It's a little weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why we have crews, right? To do, to, <laughs> to, right, take, right, one, right. take one for you the team. You go ahead, bro. You go ahead. Just, you know, I got insurance. Yeah, yeah. The day that we shot the film, we didn't even know if we were going to be able to fly because this pea soup fog had had been hugging the coast all the way up to the islands. And what we don't really talk about in the film is that how far offshore we were going that day in the helicopter. So we did, you know, it was kind of like a day in the life of. So we photographed like one start of a race and it was an offshore distance race. And um, we didn't even know until moments before whether we were going to be able to fly because this fog bank because obviously it can't land, let alone can they see anything. And, and there's nothing to photograph in the fog anyway. So, so it was just moments before we were supposed to, you know, be at the helicopter and the guy came up from LA to pick me up. And, um, and I was talking to all the navigators on the boats and they said, okay, you know, it's going to clear, it's going to clear. And so we get out there, we get going and off we go. And we could see all the way out to the islands. They were rounding these islands that are 25 miles offshore. And that was our intercept point starting at 25 miles. So we were going, you know, probably 35, 40 miles offshore and um, we could see the islands. It was great. So off we go and we're, we're working for almost two hours and we're checking the fuel, checking the fuel. We needed, you know, half an hour of fuel to get back safely. And the pilot, he was very cautious and great. And we're talking and, you know, we're shooting and we're photographing and it wasn't the most riveting day. It was not exactly fresh to frightening, <laughs> which it was supposed to be, but it wasn't. And, um, and then as we turn around, he goes, okay, it's time, you know, this is the last boat you'll be able to photograph. We've got to go back. And, and it's close to sunset as well. It's like really, really late in the day at this point. And all of a sudden we turned to go back and the fog bank had rolled in and it went straight down to the water and all the way up to like a thousand feet. And it was socked in all the way back to Santa Barbara. And so he turned the helicopter, went back to clear air and we went up to about a thousand feet above the fog bank. And, and then it's just this weird feeling. It's like this vertigo feeling when you're flying above the fog and or above clouds and fog. Mm -hmm. And so off we go. And it just feels like you're suspended. It doesn't feel like you have any speed, even though we're going the same speed we were <laughs> before. And so we were lucky to be able to land back in Santa Barbara because the, the fog uh, stopped just before the coastline, which is just before the airport. So we're able to get in, 
But, you know, we don't really, there's a little bit of that in the film where he's talking about, well, this is the price we have to pay. And um, and then when we head back, but- We're saving, um, it, we're saving it for the feature length. Like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the episodic, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my heart's racing just thinking I know. about that. Wow. <laughs> and I need, I need some water. <laughs> but uh, on that note, thank you so much. We really enjoyed this short. Uh, we've thank been you. speaking with director Gareth Kelly and rock star yacht photographer Sharon mm -hmm. Green. Uh, from the film Fresh to Frightening, the Sharon Green story. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions.